All right, good evening everyone, Erev Tov, welcome to Echoes of Eden uh, this evening as we continue through Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, uh, coming to the 31st portion, 31st division of the Torah, the portion known as Imor. Uh, we'll talk about what Imor means and uh, where it's at in Leviticus uh, after we begin with the blessing before the study of Torah. So let's pray. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kiddishanu b'mitzvita v'sivanu l'esok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to be immersed into the words and the matters of Torah. Amen. So, Imor covers Leviticus chapter 21 through chapter 24, verse 23. And as I said, uh, it is the uh, 31st division. It's the second to last division in uh, the book of Leviticus. And next week we'll be finishing up Leviticus. Uh, Imor uh, is a word that means speak. Uh, it comes from the opening verse in the portion in Leviticus 21, or verse 1, when um, the Lord commands Moses to speak to the sons of Israel, that is Emor. Uh, and so that is where we are at in the portion, are in the Torah. So what's the portion about? Um, it's kind of a, um, a review portion in some ways, or uh, it also kind of has a wonderful paradox to it that we'll talk about as we uh, conclude this evening in our time to be mindful. Uh, but one of the things it's probably most famous for or uh, known for is that it contains a review or a listing of all of the major festivals or holy days in the biblical calendar. Uh, it kind of gives uh, what they are, uh, when they're to be celebrated and so forth. And so this evening, uh, we'll look at those festivals from kind of two perspectives. We'll look at it, one, in the sense of uh, shadows of Messiah, how Messiah is found in those festivals and how they point to Messiah, how they inform us of Messiah and Messiah's work. But uh, we'll also look at them from the perspective, again, of learning how the Torah for our life and our, our well-being uh, gives us rhythms and gives us uh, these days of connection for our well-being, our spiritual well-being, and even our physical uh, well-being. And so we will spend some time with those festivals. But the portion actually begins with laws uh, pertaining to the priests and the high priest, uh, and specifically how... Um, they are to do their service in the tabernacle. So it talks about how a priest uh, may not become ritually impure. He's not to become impure by having contact uh, with a dead body, save on the occasion that it's the death of a close relative. Uh, a priest may not marry a divorcee or a woman with a promiscuous past. A uh, high priest uh, can marry only a virgin. Uh, a priest with a physical deformity cannot serve in the tabernacle, nor can a deformed animal be brought as an offering. And so Imor kind of begins with these kind of rules and laws and regulations for, again, the c concept of holiness. Uh, as we go through, we'll, we'll again hopefully uh, flesh out how even these passages can still speak truths to us today. The second part of the portion, as I said, I've already alluded to, lists the so-called divine appointments, those appointments that God has made on his calendar with humanity. Uh, the festivals of the biblical calendar uh, that are mentioned here include these holy days, the weekly Sabbath that we've talked to quite a bit about in Echoes of Eden, uh, also, the bringing of the Passover offering on the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, which is in the Hebrew calendar. Nisan is the first month of spring. It's the first month of the religious calendar, uh, the biblical calendar. And then it talks about the seven-day Passover festival that begins on the 15th day of Nisan. The bringing of the Omer offering from the barley harvest 
on the second day of Passover, and then what is known as the counting of the Omer. Uh, Instead of a countdown, it's a count up from the second day after Passover up to 49. And then on the 50th day after that uh, is a festival that it describes known as Shavuot, our weeks, our we call Pentecost. Pentecost meaning 50th. Uh, It's called that because it's essentially 50 days after Passover. And it's a harvest festival. Uh, Then there is the uh, remembrance of the shofar, the the blowing of the trumpet known as Rosh Hashanah, and that's on the first day of the month of Tishrei, the fall month. Uh, A solemn fast 10 days later known as Yom Kippur. Then the festival of Sukkot or tabernacles uh, where people are called to kind of Uh, dwell or have their meals outdoors in huts to remember that they were once pilgrims and uh, sojourners uh, in the land and to remember their kind of dependence upon God and God's protection of them throughout their history. Uh, And then it talks about the so-called eighth day, that is when the uh, seven-day festival of tabernacles ends. On the eighth day, there's this great day, and that's seen in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus goes up on the Temple Mount, uh, as it describes in the Gospel of John, on the last great day is how most translations put that. Uh, but now you know where that's coming from and what that day is, because it's referenced right here uh, in Leviticus chapter 23. It's the conclusion of of the festival of booths or the festival of tabernacles. Then the Torah discusses the lighting of the menorah uh, in the tabernacle and the showbread uh, that's to be placed in there weekly. And then it concludes, the portion concludes, with an incident of a man executed for blasphemy, uh, which is kind of interesting uh, that that would be included in this portion. It kind of sticks out. So we're going to spend some time, quite a bit of time, on that incident at the conclusion of Emor, uh, and so that we can actually fit it into the context uh, and why it does, in fact, make sense to follow up a review of the festivals uh, with the executioner execution of a blasphemer. Um, and then the final rules regarding uh, penalties, Uh, for the murder of a human being or uh, compensation uh, if you cause monetary loss to your neighbor. So quite a bit going on in Imor. And one of the interesting things coming through it is you have this idea of perfection, right? The priest essentially, again, not moral perfection, uh, but a sense of perfection. So the priest can't have any kind of blemishes, uh, they can't have any kind of defects, the, all, the offerings that are brought can't have any kind of blemishes or any kind of defects, they can't have any kind of broken bones, they can't have any history of injury and so forth. A- and you even have throughout Leviticus, last week's portion into this week's portion, this whole idea of uh, be ye therefore perfect as your Father or your, as the Lord God is perfect. And you think, how in the world can that really be asking us that? Um, And that's what we're going to conclude with this evening and being mindful is that the idea is that uh, it's a paradox, but paradoxes are are the stuff of the Bible. Uh, And we're going to land on the idea that we are perfectly imperfect. And as long as we are perfectly imperfect, we are exactly what's being talked about in Leviticus. Uh, And so it isn't as distant from us as we may think, uh, or it isn't as foreign to us. We just kind of got to get past the language, um, and there we'll find the nuggets for us. All right, so let's kind of dive into the text. Uh, The second, uh, uh, yeah, the second verse of chapter 23 um, says these words. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. My appointed times are these. All right. And so let's talk a little bit about the appointed times and and how as followers of Messiah, 
uh, that it's still important for us to know what these are uh, because the reality is, is to study them or to learn about them is to study Messiah and to learn about Messiah. And so while on the surface, if you were to just tell someone, oh, we covered the seven Levitical festivals, you may think that's just kind of a historical lesson or historical context, but that's not what it is. If you really spend the time to think about it and process it, you realize that to know these festivals is to know the Messiah because they point to the Messiah. Therefore, they inform us about the Messiah and they inform us about his work on our behalf and therefore they draw us closer to him. Uh, and so it's more than just kind of some kind of historical review. It's quite applicable in the sense that it speaks directly to who the one we claim as Lord and Savior, who he is, what's his character, what was he about? What was his mission? Why did he do the things he did? And why did they happen on the days that they happened on? Um, those kind of questions can be answered by knowing the festivals. In fact, all of the epistles in the New Testament, all of them, correspond to one of these festivals. So, for instance, you have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. 1st Corinthians is very much written for the beginning of the Passover celebration. And you can tell that because it's structured like a synagogue sermon and its text is right in the middle and it's the text that's read on uh, Passover at the beginning. Second Corinthians is for the ending of Passover seven days later. First and second Thessalonians, same thing. They're bookends for the festival of Sukkot. Romans um, ties into uh, Shavuot and Pentecost. So does Galatians. Uh, so they all have connections, and so the more you know about the festivals, the more you pick up on even what New Testament writings are about. Uh, because in many ways, when Paul would write an epistle, for instance, he would write it thematic to the lectionary. He would write it thematic to what the people would have been hearing and studying in their local synagogue or in their house church and so forth, uh, just like wouldn't be uncommon today if uh, someone is going to send a letter to a congregation to encourage them and 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 lead them or mentor them or offer them advice and it's just coming up on um, Christmas time or Easter time or you pick a holiday it would be very common to invoke those themes because that's what they're studying that's what they're thinking about and so again the festivals help inform us about these things. Uh, the book of Revelation, the seven churches, the seven can all the sevens float around the seven, seven main festivals. Uh, so it's all connected. So it's not just kind of a review of the history. Now in Leviticus 23, as I said, God gives a calendar to his people. I don't know why this isn't more mind-blowing to the people of God within the church. God gives a calendar to us, his people. He gives us a calendar. Why do we ignore the calendar God created? But yet, we often do. The biblical calendar is different from the one in which we are accustomed, uh, the so-called Gregorian calendar. The biblical calendar is largely, though not exclusively, lunar. Uh, and what I mean by that is it's based on the phases of the moon. The waxing and the waning of the moon determine the day of the biblical month. The tiny sliver of the new moon always appears on what will be deemed as the first day of the month. The full moon indicates the middle of the month, and the disappearance of the moon indicates the end of the month. And so it's largely lunar, but not exclusively, because the Hebrew calendar always wants the first full moon of spring to be in the month of Nisan. And so it balances it with periodic lunar years in which not a day is added, but an entire month is added. That way, Nisan always falls in the spring. It's always the first month of the spring. So again, largely lunar, but not exclusively, which is what you would expect from a Hebraic perspective. It's a balance of both the solar and the lunar, okay? And so God declares, uh, in, starting in Leviticus 23 and verse 2, 
that certain days are to be what are called in Hebrew moedim, uh, M-O-E-D-I-M, moedim, which is the plural of moed, M-O-E-D, uh, which doesn't mean holidays, and it doesn't mean uh, festival, but it's okay to translate it that way, but it literally means appointment, like as in on your calendar. Uh, that So God has made appointments, the Lord's appointed times, his appointments, which you shall proclaim as holy, convocations, meaning you're to convocation there, coming the, the kahal, meaning you're to gather as a community for these things, all right? So God's made an appointment, and he wants his people to recognize that appointment, to meet that appointment, to make it to that appointment, and to do so uh, as something that's holy, that's set apart, that's different, uh, and convocate uh, to do that not only individually, but also as um, a community. And so what this means for us is that in Leviticus 23, it's kind of like being able to read God's day planner back uh, before the days of phones having our calendars or before the invention of, you remember the so-called Palm Pilot right, uh, where you had your little stylus and you could do your little digital calendar. Back in the old day, right, there was a daily planner, right, and, you, you know, that's kind of what we have in Leviticus 23. We get a glimpse into God's planner where he's made appointments to meet with his people for specific purposes, and again, the days include things like the Sabbath or the Passover, or the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, uh, the Feast of Booth, also known as Tabernacles or Sukkot. The Apostle Paul, in his New Testament letters, when he speaks about these uh, Moedim, these appointments, he calls them shadows cast by the Messiah. That's in Colossians, that they are shadows cast by the Messiah the Messiah. That means that each of God's appointed times teaches us something about the Messiah. And that makes sense because when you think about it, almost all of these appointed times commemorate some great past act of redemption. Redemption is deeply connected to almost all of God's appointed festivals. Uh, for example, the Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorates the exodus from Egypt. The biblical festivals can also be understood as uh, an eschatological blueprint, that is, a blueprint for what is to come as well. They lay out the pattern of redemption because they are truly God's appointed times interacting with us. Each appointed time not only foreshadows one of God's appointed plans of redemption, but each year that we go through it and we don't find its fulfillment, it's being filled full, it's a rehearsal for the big thing. And so it also is preparing us. That's why it's important to go through the calendar and be mindful of it. And even like with the Torah, hopefully those that are regulars with Echoes of Eden and you've been living in the times, hopefully you've begun to experience, wow, there is something to this rhythm thing and being in tune with God's rhythm. And so it, it's constantly rehearsing us, rehearsing us for what is to come. Hence, these are the appointed times of Messiah. So in the New Testament, uh, they come up when you see verses like this in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, when it talks about the times and the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's referring to these appointments. Or uh, in Matthew 24, on that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father. He has made appointments on his calendar. So again, to study the festivals, the Moedim, these appointments that are in Leviticus, it's not only to study the past, it's studying the present. And it's also studying the future all at once. This week's portion uh, in Leviticus 23, verse 21, it says this. It is to be a perpetual statue hmm. in all your dwelling places, no matter where you live. 
throughout your generations. It's God's calendar, and it's going to stay God's calendar. So imagine being one of those early followers of Jesus, keeping these divine appointments. Imagine being among the disciples when they kept the Feast of Passover one year after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Think of what that would have been like to truly keep the Passover in remembrance of the Messiah. Jesus' death and resurrection imbued all the rituals that they had been performing since their childhood, but now it's filled full. It has new life. It has additional meaning. It has deeper and richer purpose. The death of the lamb became a solemn reminder of the death of their Savior. The matzah at the Seder meal became a reminder of Jesus' body that was striped and pierced and broken and buried and resurrected, which is what you do with the matzah on the night of Passover. For their entire childhood and into their adulthood, they had been holding up matzah that was striped and pierced, that they broke, that they wrapped in linen, that they buried away during the meal, that they brought back. And now they know why they did it. It didn't do away with it. Instead, it made it make more sense. So think about that year afterwards when they are holding up that pierced and striped and broken bread and remembering him saying to them, this is my body. Or the cup of the Seder becoming the reminder of his blood. The bitter herbs, a reminder of the heartbreak and the tears that were shed on that fateful day. Think of what it must have been like on the anniversary of the resurrection on the day of first fruits, which is why Paul in Corinthians in the great resurrection chapter of chapter 15 calls Jesus the first fruits from the dead because he rose on the festival that's mentioned in Leviticus 23 called first fruits. It was a first fruit festival. It was always the Sunday following unleavened bread. That's the deeper meaning of he's the first fruits. He rose on first fruits. And now that thing that they had been celebrating again since childhood now is concrete. Remember, they would say at this time last year when he appeared in our midst, as they began counting up the days to Pentecost, They would have remembered the days of the risen Jesus walking among them. And nine days before Pentecost, the disciples would have recollected it was on this day, Memba Omer, the 40th day of the counting of the Omer, one year ago that we ascended on the top of Mount Olives to watch him ascend to his father. Imagine regathering with the believers in the temple on that Pentecost The next year, the disciples would have said last year, there was about 120 of us gathered here. This year, there are thousands upon thousands of us. To those early believers, it must have been perfectly clear that the festivals were all about the Messiah. The portion also says this regarding the festivals. Leviticus 23, verse 44 So Moses declared to the sons of Israel the appointed times of the Lord. The appointed times of the Lord, again, are rehearsals for the ultimate appointed times of redemption. They are the blueprints for the work of the Messiah. The spring festivals like Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits up to Pentecost in many ways have had their filling full at Jesus' first advent, at Messiah's first coming. But the fall festivals, things like the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, these days of judgment when the book of life is opened, as the Torah describes, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or the eighth day, the new creation. These have not been filled full yet 
by our Messiah. So how much more important it is for us to study them yearly when they occur because they are preparing us for that day when they find their fulfillment. Colossians 2, verse 17. These are all a shadow of the things to come. It's a way to study what is coming. Now, on your sheet, I gave kind of a very quick cursory, definitely not in-depth kind of summary um, of the festivals, the, the appointments kind of mentioned, with, again, a very, very brief kind of comment with its messianic significance. So the Sabbath, right? You have the Sabbath rest of creation, the final redemption, the final reign of peace of the Messiah, the idea that there are seven uh, periods of world history, uh, each not so much literally, but being a thousand years uh, in length. And then that final one is the great Sabbath rest of the Messiah, where when Messiah comes and reigns, he brings rest, the much needed rest to humanity. Then there's the Passover and unleavened bread, connections with the Last Supper, the Messiah as our Passover lamb, his death, his resurrection. First fruits of the barley. Uh, again, Messiah's resurrection, as we've kind of talked about. Uh, Pentecost, as we might call it. Also called weeks or Shavuot, uh, the outpouring of Messiah's spirit. Then you have these long, dry summer months that have no appointments. And that kind of points to the time in which we're living in in our current age. And that is the absence of Messiah's physical presence in our midst between his two advents. Then you move into the fall festivals with uh, the festival of trumpets or the appointment of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, which is like that blast, blast. When you hear the trumpet blast, right, you hear about all of that, that's Rosh Hashanah. That's Rosh Hashanah. Uh, The return of the Messiah, the trumpet of the last days, the day of atonement, Uh, speaking to the work of Messiah's blood and the day of final judgment, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, the Messiah who has and will come to tabernacle among us. And the eighth day again is that whole idea of the new creation. Uh, So those are, again, just a look at what makes up a big portion of Imor, and that is uh, the Moedim, the divine appointments. And so I just want to Uh, give you thought for that and to just uh, know where they're at in the year and and remember that when these events occur, that's the season we're in, right? That's the season we're in. Uh, And that can shape our prayer life and and our thoughts and our interactions with others. Uh, We can begin to see uh, how that's playing out on a bigger scale in history and how these Uh, Each year, uh, as we rehearse them, are becoming closer and closer to being filled full. This next section is kind of short, but what I wanted to do with it was, I've mentioned it before, but I want to give you an example of it. And then by showing you or giving you an example of it, it over time enables you to do it on your own. But the Torah is never repetitive even when it seems repetitive, it's not repetitive. Every word is inspired. Every word is intentional. There's nothing extraneous. uh, There's nothing extra. So when something seems repetitive or redundant, it's actually a literary method in the Hebraic mind to draw your attention to it. It's not so much a literary method in the West That's not so much a literary method for us, though it probably could be. It probably could be. Um, I would think if you were writing a a fine piece of literature and all of a sudden your language began to change or it became quite different in style and then it resumed to how it had been the whole time before, it might draw your attention to that like, Why did all of a sudden he just drop into third person when it's been in first person the whole time or vice versa? Or why has it been formal English and now this very small section is very informal but then it resumes, right? It could still work for us 
We don't use it much, but it's very common in Hebraic literature, in Eastern literature. Uh, and so you see it quite a bit in the Torah. Uh, and so I just want to give you a quick example from Rashi uh, in the Kumash, his commentary on the Torah, of when he sees redundancy in this particular verse or repetition, how he stops because it troubles him. Uh, what's troubling Rashi in this verse? We'll find out. And then how he reconciles it. And what you see is when there's repetition or redundancy or something in the verbiage that sticks out like a sore thumb and draws your attention to it, it's usually so you can extrapolate a lesson. Okay? And really the depths of what you can pl uh, pull out of that isn't a single lesson. Right? That's part of how the Torah gives you uh, uh, unlimited pool, right? It's, you can just keep going back to the well. So I want to give you one example of this. So going back to the opening verse of the portion, speak, Imor, right, the name of a portion, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, now there's already two different redundancies. We're only going to focus on one. Priests are sons of Aaron, but so you don't need to repeat that. Uh, but you also, what do you see? Speak and say. Well, if I tell you speak to them, or if I tell you say, why do I got to say speak and say? Right? So that's one of the redundancies that sticks out to Rashi. And then what you're to speak and say. So can you distinguish for me what's the difference between speaking and saying? In fact, they come from the same Hebrew root, so it seems redundant. Let none of you defile himself for a dead person. In other words, the priest, uh, there are some exceptions but that are outlined, but the general rule here is a priest has to kind of avoid contact with the dead. Which, by the way, when you get into the Gospel of Luke and the parable of the Good Samaritan and a Levite comes across this guy left for dead and all bloody and he walks on the other side of the road, this is why. Okay? It's not because he's heartless and cruel. Uh, it's not because he could care less. It's because he's probably on his way to do his job in the temple and if he stops... He can't do his job, and he also has disobeyed God. Now, there's more to it. When we were in Luke, we'd look at it, but sometimes, sometimes you, knowing that little fact can help better understand that parable in its more true context, right? Guy was just doing what the Bible told him to do. Now, there's more to that, and Jesus also will come back with, yeah, but the Bible also says and there's more to it. But that's the background of it. All right? So, the words speak to the priest and say to them. Repetitive. Having instructed Moses to speak about the special restrictions pertaining to the priest, why was it necessary to reiterate and say to them? Rashi, noting this redundancy, explains that the phrase and say to them alludes to a separate set of instructions which was conveyed to the priests, that they must ensure that even their young children who have not yet reached their age of responsibility or their priestly duties are in observance of these unique priestly laws as well. In Rashi's words, the double expression is used in order to caution the adults concerning minors. The Hebrew word that Rashi uses to caution is lehatzir which can be translated as to make shine because it comes from the root zohar, to gleam or to shine. And so the words thus hint that the obligation of lehatzir, cautioning others from negative conduct, is achieved primarily by focusing in on their inherent goodness, their calling as priest, and nurturing this until you cause it to shine forth from them from within. In addition, the word lahzir underscores that our concern to teach and caution others causes us to shine as well. Talmud says of someone who teaches a fellow the word of God, God enlightens the eyes of both of them. 
And so you may not follow Rashi's argument there. That's okay. My goal tonight, because we still got 24 more Torah, 23 more Torah classes. My goal tonight is to get you used to the concept that when there's repetition, you pause and you look at the words themselves and the words around them, and then you go mining for gold. Again, we don't do that in the West, but that doesn't mean people in the East haven't historically done that with their literature. They have. And so we want to learn that process. The best way to learn it is to first be aware of it. So now for you, what all this means is when you're reading the Bible, just pay attention to when it seems redundant, when it's like, and he said, say to them, saying, right? You're like, whoa, that's a whole lot of saying and said, right? So just start noticing that. Then once you regularly notice that, you're ready then to start kind of plummeting to the next level. So that's my main goal in introducing it to you. is isn't to teach you to buy Rashi's explanation or anything or to fully understand it, but to show you, have your eyes open. Because this is how historically, including first century Galilean Jews, interpreted their Bible. And for me, as a follower of a first century Galilean Jew, as my Messiah, I kind of think it's neat to know how he was taught the Bible and how he taught the Bible to others. What was his worldview? It's kind of informative to me. And I hope it's informative to you. So for now, just start when, you read, when you're reading the Bible. See if you notice them. Because they're in English. You don't have to know Hebrew to catch them. You catch it right there in English, right? Um, they're all over the place. You can start once you notice it. Then just start looking at commentaries. Because other people know to do this too. Start reading commentaries about it. Explore it, right? Then, then start taking the progression, okay? Study in contrast. Now, this is going to be a little lengthy, but I think it's fun, and I think it's worth it, and it's another place where I will give you a concrete example of the Hebrew Hebraic toolbox that's in your Echoes from Eden handout, specifically looking at those verbal tallies. So, you know, not too far in the past, uh, as we were looking into uh, the portions, like we looked at Ve'ahavta, and you shall love, remember that? Only occurs in uh, Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, and so that's where Jesus links those passages, because you have this really big, powerful word, you're to love, but it only occurs twice. And so you have this linking of it, these, this linking of the the chain. Give you another example of the linking of a chain where a specific phrase only occurs twice in the Torah. And then when you make that connection, not only is it super, like to me, super nifty, but it makes, it makes the story, the bigger story, all the way back in Exodus, even with Moses and uh, when he killed the Egyptian and all of that, it even starts making that story make sense. And historically, the commentaries have picked up on this particular uh, verbal tally, uh, and it makes its way into the Midrash, and there's quite a bit of the rest of the story there, some of which I'll share with you tonight. But also underneath this, you have this study of contrast because it's very clear, becomes very clear. It's not very clear at the beginning. That, f that one verbal tally will make it clear. There's a contrast being made between Moses and this blasphemer at the end of Emor, right? Remember I said, why, why conclude? You have all this dialogue about the festivals and all of a sudden a blasphemer is executed and you're like, that seems out of left field, right? Um, but there's a really a good connection. So, again, I'm going to try to bring in that toolbox and, like, live it out for you. And then just 
pick up what you can. Pick up what you can. So the very last portion of Imor, the last narrative of this portion, recounts the story of a certain man who cursed God. The Torah is quick to note that this man was the son of a Jewish woman, a Hebrew woman, and an Egyptian father. Now, again, nothing in the Torah is just like, oh, I think I'll just fill in some details. Like, that's important. It's important, we're going to see, for at least two reasons. One is kind of a moral, ethical, very practical 2023 application for us. And another is letting the text flow better and making these connections. So this man that curses God has a Hebrew mother and an Egyptian father. Because his mother was from the tribe of Dan, he quite logically attempted to set up his tent, his family, have his property, you know, all that kind of stuff within the area that was allotted to Dan. Makes sense, doesn't it? However, he was told that the right to camp with a particular tribe was not related to who your mother was, but it was related to who your father was. And since he had an Egyptian father, he was not allowed to set up his tent, his family, his inheritance, his connections with the community, all of that. It's a big deal. It's more than just like where you're pitching your tent for the night and camping. Right? This is the neighborhood. These are your people. This is your community. He was told you're not allowed in the community of Dan. So he took the matter to court. He took it to the judges. He took it to the elders, if you will, and they ruled against him. At this point, he cursed God, an extremely serious infraction. Tellingly, there is a strong connection between the story and the beginning of the portion more, where physical blemishes disqualify a priest from performing certain tabernacle services. The Bible loves bookends, right? That might be one of my catchphrases, right? Names are never just names. Places are never just places. It's both and and more. Well, this is another one. The Bible loves bookends. So this portion has bookends, but at first they don't seem like bookends. Got the rules about, and they love sandwiches, by the way, too. The Bible loves sandwiches, right? Story, meat in the middle that's completely irrelevant, seemingly not connected, piece of bread, right? Gospels love it. The Torah loves it. You got a sandwich and more. Laws about priestly qualifications and no blemishes. The festivals, the Moedim, the divine appointments. And then this story about the blasphemer. The bookends are related. Although the blasphemer's blemish is not physical. Within the context of camp life, he could never forget, though, the emotional badge of shame that he wore. He had an emotional blemish. While his ultimate outburst was entirely unacceptable, the pain experienced every day by him was no doubt hard to bear. He was not one of us. Every day he was reminded of that. You're not one of us. You don't belong here. Every day, you can't camp with us. You have to camp with the strangers in our midst over there. We don't care that your mother is related to the patriarch Dan, one of the sons of Jacob. It means nothing to us. Your father is an Egyptian. You're mixed blood. Imagine the shame. Imagine dealing with that every day and then finally getting your day in court thinking you might receive justice at last and yet justice denied from his perspective. Nevertheless, like all souls that enter this world, the blasphemer did have a choice on how to deal with his lot in life. In general, We can adopt one of two attitudes towards life. We can believe that everything that happens 
is part of something bigger than ourselves, even if we can't see why or explain it, even if it's really hurting and it's really bad, and yes, it causes real tears, and yes, it causes real anger, and yes, it causes us to have questions for every day until we leave this world, we can still believe even though all of that is reality, there's something beyond what I can make of it. Or we can just assume that everything is just happenstance. There is no intrinsic rhyme or reason. There is no bigger play uh, going on. There is no God that is bigger than the situation and sees more than we do. And everything is happening out of blind luck and fate. And we have no reason to expect at all that whether it's this side of heaven or the other side of heaven, that we will experience some type of vindication or justice or understanding or peace. Obviously, depending on how we approach life, our experience of life will be significantly different. The section describing the incident of the blasphemer begins with these words. Leviticus 24, verse 10. And the son of the Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian man, went out among the children of Israel. Two big phrases going on in that verse. Leviticus 24, verse 10. First, there's the phrase, went out, which assumes that the blasphemer was in some sense on the inside before he went outside. Drawing upon this reading, Rashi posits a number of possible interpretations which range from the more straightforward reading to deeper ones. Uh, One of the straightforward readings suggests that the blasphemer exited the court of justice. He went out from the court of justice when he lost his case and subsequently cursed God. That's the Peshat. But a deeper reading proceeds logically from went out or going out or comes out because that goes back to the discussion of blemishes at the beginning of the portion of Imor. The blasphemer's psychological blemish was as real as any physical blemish, if not more so. But here is something that I think, I think you're going to like this. Notice it says his father was an Egyptian man. Leviticus 24.10, and only one other place in the Torah, do you have the phrase Egyptian man. You know where the other time Egyptian man occurs? When Moses sees an Egyptian man beating a Hebrew slave. So, there's a connection between these two. The blasphemer's father, the Egyptian that married the Israelite from Dan, was actually the Egyptian Moses killed when he witnessed him beating the Hebrew slave. The Midrash then states, based upon this verbal tally connection, that the Egyptian had slipped into the blasphemer's mother's bed while her husband was at work at night, and unbeknownst to her, slept with him. When her husband found out, the Egyptian beat him mercilessly. You can find the commentary on that in the Kumish and Rashi in Exodus 2.11. From this unholy union, the blasphemer was born, and in saving the blasphemer's non-biological father, What happened to Moses? Moses lost his privileged status as the prince of Egypt, and he had to flee and run for his life for the next 40 years. Thus, the lives of Moses and the blasphemer are profoundly intertwined. And we're not done with that yet. When we get into the book of Numbers, we'll find out a couple of more people involved in Moses' and that incident in Exodus. 
A comparison, though, of how the blasphemer in Moses dealt with the seemingly fickle blows of fortune is highly instructive. And here's the study in contrast. The blasphemer was bitter and rebellious. He felt that he was the victim of a cruel and fickle fate, and that ultimately led to the outburst where he cursed God for his plight. Almost following the advice of one of Job's friends, curse God and die. Moses could have reacted the same way. One day he was the prince of Egypt. The next day he's a fugitive. Furthermore, it seems as if the person who informed the authorities about Moses' actions may very well have been the Hebrew that he saved. Indeed, the day after Moses killed the Egyptian, he saw two Hebrews fighting. Those two Hebrews are going to come up in the book of Numbers. And tried to break up their fight. The Midrash informs us that one of the men taunted Moses, subtly threatening to turn him over to the authorities if he didn't mind his own business. And this man, according to the Midrash, was the blasphemer's non-biological father, for who else would have known about the murder? Thus the man Moses, the one that he had saved, instead of showing Moses gratitude, threatened him. Immediately after confronting Moses, murder of the Egyptian, it became known to Pharaoh and Moses has to flee. Losing his privileged status, suffering 40 years in exile, all for defending what would become a very thankless person. So Moses had many opportunities in life to become bitter and resentful. Yet he doesn't lose hope. He doesn't descend into despair. He doesn't curse the God of Israel for his fate. And his approach to life was probably one of the reasons God chose him to be the redeemer of Israel from Egypt. The overall big message here, although we cannot control all that happens in our life, we can control our reactions. Once when I saw a counselor, I don't remember anything of it other than this one phrase, but it changed my life. Chad, you can get bitter or you can get better. The choice is yours. And that's the contrast between these two. Both were given raw deals. No mistake about it. Both got raw deals. Both had a lot to complain about. Both could look and say, why is my life this way? But they responded completely differently. So although we cannot control all that happens, we can control how we react to it and how we choose to define it, and how we choose to define it for ourselves. And so we will all be tested. We will all have blemishes. This is the existential reality that none of us avoid. Yet we all have the power to determine how we choose to react to those forces beyond our control and how we experience life. This understanding of Emore's narrative framework, its bookends, its sandwich, the theme of physical and psychological blemishes and how we might deal with them, leads to another insight regarding the structure of the portion. In the middle of the portion, the meat of the sandwich, it repeats the entire divine appointment cycle, including the Sabbath. So now you get, you get to ask the question, okay, I can sort of see the connection between the bookends, blemish of this. What's the meat of the festivals got to do with it? The divine appointments. So think about it. What have we been talking about every time we come across the Sabbath or some of the other divine appointments? What are they teaching us about life? The rhythms and the cycles and the seasons and how to live in the times and how to live in the flow of what God is revealing and making available to us. So in light of our insight, we can suggest that the Sabbath and those other appointments on God's calendar are there for us as a welcome relief 
from the constant grind of personal, financial, and professional concerns that occupy so much of our time during the week. Overwhelmed by problems, it's often hard for us to see the forest for the trees. We're lost in the maze of the world's blemishes. The divine appointments provide us the opportunity to stop, to pause, to take a step back and see the true context of how God is at work in this world. The joy and spiritual delight of holy days allow us to see beyond the superficial and remember life's real purpose. During these moments of clarity, we can free ourselves from blemishes and we can have acceptance and inner peace. With that, we'll move into being mindful of Emor. It's a fascinating portion. Rich, rich in paradox. So I want to talk about that and how to incorporate paradox into our life, including God's call to be perfect when he fully well knows we're imperfect. Has that never bothered you? Because it's bothered me for a long, it was, it bothered me enough to where I left the faith for a while. Why did you make me imperfect and demand perfection from me? Why do you demand perfection from someone and something that you know darn well can never be perfect? Maybe I'm the only one that struggled with that. I don't know. I know Dr. Martin Luther struggled with that. Until I figured out paradox. Until I figured out paradox. And more speaks to that balance of How do we as fallen creatures live as creatures of light? How do we, with chaos in our hearts and our minds, exude shalom and peace to others and within ourselves? How can you ask a priest to not have any blemish when, God, you definitely know, if that priest is an adult male, Somewhere in his first 30 years, he's had a blemish of some sort. Physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological. He's not without blemish. How could any priest do this? Let's find out. Because it more tells us. It tells us how to do it. And then we'll do a little reflection on those festivals and how they can still speak to us. Because this week, what's amazing is the energy of all of those festivals are available to you. Passover's back. You don't have to wait till next April. It's this week. You don't got to wait till the fall for Rosh Hashanah. It's this week because they're all recorded and recalled in this week's portion. This portion's just like glowing. It's powerful. So, let's find out how to get some of it. The Torah. And later, the Apostle Peter encourages us, exhorts us, that we're to be a nation, a people, of priests. Whether you just are Old Testament or you're only a New Testament person, you're exhorted to be a priest. And then you're like, oh, that whole without blemish thing? Hmm." Each one of us is called to fulfill a priestly function of mediating between the human and and the divine of this world and the world to come or the world above. In a more, we are told that the priest must be unblemished. And the offerings that he brings must also be without spot or blemish. As I seek to fulfill my priestly function, I look at my life. I look at the physical universe that surrounds me. I look at nature. I look into the human predicament of every person that I've ever met. And I cannot find someone or something That is unblemished. The closer I look, the more imperfections and more blemishes I find. Everything and everyone is in process. That's what that really means. When you have blemishes, just remember we just learned a key factor of life is how you define things. We are all searching for balance in a world that is highly unbalanced 
and in flux. And we are all flawed. Our physical bodies are either slowly or quickly decaying. But this is the paradox of Imor. I and everything that I offer is likewise flawed, marked with the limitations of my particular perspective or my prejudice or bias, and yet the truth of perfection permeates the atmosphere of my life like a tantalizing fragrance. Imor is paradox. To receive the blessing of paradox means that I have to expand my embrace. I must create a wider context in which to live and encompass the contradictions that paradox seemingly is offering me. To live with paradox means I must always be expanding my conception and perception of reality. And so I must live in process, continually opening to a wider view. The process itself touches me with its beauty. The paradox, one of them, is this, that we are both perfect and imperfect at the same time. Or, shall I say it in words familiar to this building, you are simo justus et picator from Dr. Martin Luther and our confessions. You are both saint and sinner at the exact same time. Hmm. If the priestly function is to mediate between the human and the divine, between this world and the world above, of course it would make sense that we are both, that we are of this world and the world to come, that we are fleshly but created in the image of God. We are spiritual. There are times when I look into this world or into the blemishes of my own character and I'm shown the perfection of the greater whole. Not only do I see it, I experience that perfection as a rightness, and I'm overcome by its beauty. I celebrate the perfection and let it inspire me and empower me. Experiencing that perfection gives me the strength to bear my oh-so-many imperfections. So within perfection is a dance. We learn and we suffer. We die and we're reborn. And those blemishes that might have disqualified me from the priesthood actually become my new doorways into my power as a priest. It's only when I deny those blemishes or I try to hide those blemishes from God or myself or others, only then am I rejected and my offerings rejected. But when I enter through them, I can touch the perfection with all of my imperfection. It is then that I realize that I am perfectly imperfect. Our spiritual challenge this week is to acknowledge with our eyes wide open our flaws and the harm that we have caused through our actions, the suffering, the injustice, and the cruelty that pervade our world, to look at it all and be honest about it. And at the same time, seek to see the absolute perfection in it all. Imor gives us guidance to rise to this challenge. With the celebration of the holy days, the Torah gives me a path of continually becoming. During time set aside for holiness, I can dip into the timeless well of perfection and then dive back into the swirling river of change and imperfection. The cycles of the Sabbath and the other festivals and feasts allow me to drink from the Eden streams and then send me back to face the world of brokenness. It's no different than the way you should approach the sacrament of Holy Communion. It's a meal for sinners. It's a meal for broken people. And yet, when you're partaking of it, you're a complete saint. And you're in the presence of the Almighty. And you're outside of this space and time. And it's all there in perfect perfection so that it restores you and sends you back 
into the world of imperfection. It's a process. It's ebb and flow. It's run and return. It's descent for the sake of ascent. So some sacred rhythm practices. Festivals like Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. They connect me with the cycles of planting and harvest because that's what those are. Those are. That's where they are in the calendar. And that helps me learn to face death and find new seeds for planting as a new cycle renews itself. Times like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur provide me with a cycle of reflection, a time of inventory to uncover my blemishes and then turn to God and receive the inheritance of perfection, of the forgiveness that he's brought about for me in Messiah. The rhythm of the seasons is to get underneath my skin, to flow through my blood. The holy days are to direct my attention to the swelling and the shrinking of the moon as I watch a perfect circle of light disappear into darkness only to return again. It means I live in process, continually opening myself to the wider view, and it touches me with its beauty. The Torah gives me the practice of contemplating the cycles and the flow that lead me to experience a bigger picture, divine wholeness, so that I can realize I am perfectly imperfect. Amen. We will close there. We will pick it up next week in the Torah, finishing out the book of Leviticus. Shalom, shalom. Go in peace.